Ladies and gentlemen, in the blue corner, standing at a sleek 5'11", 245 pounds, the tumultuous tempest of technique, Thomas Lilly. And in the red corner, at a curvaceous 5'11", 315 pounds, the jovial juggernaut of judgment, John Cheryl Sheridan. A meeting of the masters of mastication. Turn your attention as they delve deep into all things lifting and more. This is Peak Speak. All right, we're back. Welcome back. We're back for our Peak weekly Speak. episode of Peak Speak. Recorded one and a half months after <laughs> after our last episode. Excellent. No, we, we haven't done one since nationals. How did it, how did all your people go at nationals? Man, it was a really good weekend. We had, um, yeah, it was a fucking big weekend. I genuinely don't understand how you dudes do that. Every time I go to those comps, I have a really good time and I'm just acutely aware of how little interest I have in running a comp that runs for more than one day Yes, because I just, yeah, I admire all of you greatly for the ability to back that shit up consistently because I did everything I could to not be in the meet when I wasn't dealing with my lifters <laughs> because otherwise I just would have been wiped. And as it was, I came back and got sick for a whole week anyway. So man, everyone uh, was sick. Th yeah, someone had like... someone had influenza A because uh, I I didn't test, but my girlfriend then got influenza A. A couple of the other ACT lifters, not my crew, but other um, folks also got sick on basically the exact same time scale as I did. And um, they both tested to, positive to influenza A and they were there on the Sunday. So yeah. someone turned up sick, which is a real fucking pain in the ass. Um, yeah. I, I dodged it and James dodged it, but pretty much all other, all other yeah. helpers, staff, everyone got. Yeah. Got, so someone was definitely the sick there over the weekend, but um, yeah, to answer your actual question, my career did really well. Um, we, had a couple of national champions walk away, which was nice. Sophie won the Supers. Uh, I think we had a couple of Masters national champions. I'd have to go back and look at exactly where all the results were. Mm. Um, Alex in the 82s at her first national, took a, we took a 20-kilo jump on her third deadlift to try and take the win uh, <laughs> and didn't didn't quite make it, but that was a cool experience for her. The uh, you know the frustration of like, oh, I could have done like five kilos less than that. Maybe I would have come second. I'm like, yeah, but you go to nationals to win like that's that's always been my idea tell me if this banging in the background gets too much because i don't know if you can hear it but there's a lot of banging and soaring going on outside my window no, now. I, I can't hear a thing yeah okay cool i just turned the gain down on my microphone so it should be all right um but yeah man so it was it was a great weekend i um i think that's definitely one of the best comps i've been to in a while uh and it's nice to see powerlifting at that level again you know i was i talked to a few people about it kind of feeling like a second coming of powerlifting a little bit. I don't feel like I've been to a nationals that felt that big and that exciting since, you know, that 2015, 16 era. Yeah. Um. So that was really cool to see all of that and, and to see how well run it was and how smooth the whole thing goes. It's just, yeah, a credit to you and the crew. You've all done a very good job. I, um, I sent Rochelle a message a, a few days afterwards, or maybe it was a week afterwards when I was finally functional again i said i didn't get a chance to say it in person but really really well done it was um as good as powerlifting can be i think thank you man that means a lot especially coming from someone like yourself who's been to every major comp in australia for yeah, quite a, a decade. while at this point yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 no it was a it was a monstrous weekend but it was a lot of fun it was definitely the smoothest comp we've ever run yeah for uh, sure of that size yeah um Everything just seemed to work. Like that was that was what I noticed. There were very few hiccups. And that again is just a, a great indicator of how well you and the crew are doing at learning on the job, right? Because something always comes up at a meet yeah. like that. I mean, I've I host one day meets and we're pretty fucking good at it, and something always fucks up. It doesn't sure. matter what, like how prepared you are, something goes wrong. And I think the fact that you guys did such a great job of managing that is yeah, a credit. Yeah, the, the two things we ran into were the first day, just Thursday is hard to get helpers. So yeah, yeah, we didn't have enough helpers on the desk to set up the live feed properly yeah. and have commentators for a little while. 
So the live feed wasn't as high quality on the on the first session. That um, that Thursday day is always going to be hard, man. Yeah. Like that's the, the that's really the downside of a four day meet. Exactly. Um, is people have jobs. Yeah. <laughs> like we all forget that we exist in this world where our jobs don't really exist, and we pretend to do what we do and make up our own hours. So it's it's a lot different. Yeah, yeah. So the the Thursday was a little bit choppy, but everything else was fucking great and uh thank you to everyone who came in and and pitched out um came out and pitched in in terms of helping and uh everyone who came and watched and yelled and all the lifters just it was just a great weekend really yeah man and some fucking incredible lifting too yeah um some really really excellent lifting and like really good battles as well like i i feel like that's sometimes been missing in powerlifting for a little while yeah that like yeah, it does actually come down to second and third deadlifts and smart decisions about attempts and that kind of shit. It um, it really makes a difference. For sure, man. For sure. Um, what's next on your calendar? You got ladies lifting coming. Yeah, up? we got ladies lifting coming up in a couple of weeks, which is always a really fun day. Um, and just a yeah, a, a good time really. Uh, and then. We got we got novice comp in September. Then we got the spring classic. I think it's like early November, um, which will open entries for that soon. And then yeah, novice comp at the end of the year. But I'm uh, starting a, like a new coaching group, coaching course in a couple of weeks. That's uh, a more general approach to like fundamentals. Of, I call it fitness fundamentals. Taking what I do with the powerlifting course and and making it a more general like health and fitness everyday approach, uh, which is going to be fun. Nice. Um, so that's coming up in a couple of weeks. But uh, yeah, outside of that, just chugging away, really. Nice, nice, nice. Well, that that kind of ties into what you wanted to talk about today, right? Yeah, I think so because it's kind of part of the discussions I've had on both uh discussions with potential members or, or new clients but also um on some of the stuff i've talked about on social media over the last little bit uh and it's really just about i think from my point of view looking back at how i've evolved as a coach and and how my approach to dealing with teaching people has changed over the last you know what is it over 10 years at this point um and one of the big ones is that I actually feel like I say less in the, in the discussions around teaching skills. Like I, I'm, I'm far more inclined to give a very quick demonstration and, and show you a couple of ideas and then let people learn and, and learn by doing like that. And that's where I wanted to talk to you about the, the idea of developing autonomy in people in how they learn and how they practice these things. Because I think there's a, a big element of the fitness population or the fitness professionals who whether consciously or otherwise maybe spend a bit too much time attempting to justify their own existence by framing the discussion around like you have to be taught how to do this you have to have that guidance from the start as opposed to kind of doing what people like you and I did, which is just go and fuck around for a while and learn a bunch of things. Um, and yeah, I think that's an interesting discussion to have. For sure, man. It's uh, it's an interesting one because like we have to develop that autonomy at some stage and guided yeah. help with that is going to be really important. Uh, but at the same time, if it goes too far, it's like, what the hell are you doing? That's not what I showed you to do. It's yeah, like, exactly. I, I guess my first question to you is how do you, wh where's the line that you draw? Like, how do you find that balance? I think the first one is in who are you talking to? I think there's a very big discussion. And like, this is where I think, if anything, our opinions might differ a little bit. It's again, exclusively down to the audiences we talk to. Your audience is far more on the competitive end of powerlifting, at least from my point of view, whereas mine sits on the verge of that, but also a little bit more generally as well. Um, and I think that's the biggest distinction I make is, do you want to be the best powerlifter you can be, or do you want to lift heavy weights and have fun training hard and doing those kind of things, right? Because if you want to be a powerlifter and you want to compete in the sport, then powerlifting as a sport and any sport has a set of relatively rigid demands that exist within the environment of the sport that you have to incorporate into your training process in the context of powerlifting one of those is technical precision and your ability to execute the skill at a high intensity and so that has to make up a fairly significant portion of your 
training process, both initially in terms of taking on a new client, helping them understand your model for teaching the skills and big rocks for what you're paying attention to and that kind of stuff. But they also have to continually develop that themselves. They have to be able to apply that in their training processes, all of those kind of things. For uh, anyone below someone who wants to be like on a national scale level powerlifter or someone who's had many, many years of experience in that realm, everyone else you just kind of want to go for good enough in my mind rather than perfection and the idea of, of being really, really technically solid because most people I speak to in the more general sense are if anything less likely to be the sort of person that hurts themselves from quote unquote bad technique than the meat hand end of the powerlifting realm. Right. So a lot of the discussions I have with people are like, Oh, I'm scared of doing this harder than like, what is the equivalent of a five RPE because I might hurt myself. And that's a perfectly valid fear to have, but for most of those people, they're not going to try hard enough to hurt themselves with really bad technique because they're not the sort of meathead who bashes their head into a wall continually until they make a two and a half kilo progression. So that line of are you training for a sport and a really rigid goal that you're chasing is kind of the the first port I have in that discussion. Um, and that then helps frame the rest of the discussions we have both in what do you need to think about, but also what does your training setup look like and how much of that time is devoted to skill and how much of it's just output, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think the the interesting thing, like you made that comparison about you know, our audiences and, and who we talk to, but it's funny because even you know with those differences, there's still noise and there's still those discussions to be had. Yeah, absolutely. And it's dealing with the noise sometimes can be quite challenging. I think for me, when it comes to, uh having this exact same discussion with my lifters which like you you say are a very different breed these days uh is about i guess um recognizing that in any program of any level there's certain things that are closer to non-negotiable and then there's other yeah, things absolutely. that are kind of just like i mean like you could be very very pedantic about it or you could just let it go yeah. And lean, leaning into the non-negotiables as like, no, this is this is what we're doing and why we're doing it, creating some buy-in there and then leaving some autonomy to the things that don't matter a, a little bit more. Because if you're too dogmatic about everything, people just get pissed off. Yeah, absolutely, man. And that's actually where I think you know, I've sort of boiled this, this change down in my head to I've just a far more broad understanding of what works and what doesn't in training than I used to have. I used to have this real rigid, like, you know, this relatively well-defined amount and type and volume and all of that kind of stuff. Cause we grew up in that fucking Shaco era of like counting the exact number of sets and all of that kind of stuff. And all of that's really, really great in some ways, but the reality of training is not, this is exactly what works. It's like, here's this really big area that we're going to work inside. And as long as you're consistently somewhere in that area, chances are you'll be making progress most of the time. And the more I explain that to people, not only does it help them understand things from a technical standpoint, like I don't need perf perfect. I need pretty good most of the time and you'll be okay. And also more broadly to consistency in training and building momentum across weeks and months as someone who has a life and bills to pay and in some cases kids and that kind of stuff is the idea that you like your training program is a best case scenario it's not all or nothing it's not this like if you didn't do everything in the session the session was a waste of time that's not how i write programs here's your best case scenario I want you to have the autonomy in that some days you don't have it. And some days you need to be able to pull back. Here's some relatively flexible guidelines about how to pull back and how to adjust it. Here's the context of like, cool, we can probably adjust it a bit further out from that thing you're preparing for. Then maybe if you're a bit closer and you're very serious about it and that flexibility is ultimately what helps people be okay with the quote unquote failure of like, oh, I missed a session or, or that kind of thing. 
because all of those are part of the ongoing process, right? You miss sessions over time. You have reps that don't feel right, but it's in those moments that you learn how to continue to improve in different aspects. And so if you're constantly avoiding those moments because you fear that there's something bad's going to happen because of them, you're going to have a much harder time. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with with the basically the definition of coaching which is like you're not just barking instructions at someone you're educating them you're, you're empowering yeah. them and ultimately you have to check yourself as a coach at some point and be like what what do i want the true outcome of this to be and the true outcome isn't control the true outcome is giving the person the best experience possible and hopefully yep. a lifelong learning that they can carry to the point when they're not being coached by you which is inevitable Absolutely. man i had a discussion with one of my lifters like three days ago, it was like, oh, I feel like I kind of like, this feels like an awkward conversation to have. And they're like, oh, I kind of want to take over my own programming and not be coached by you. And like still be a member of the gym, but like write their own programs. I was like, sick, dude, that's awesome. Like, that's the whole fucking idea. I've always worked on the idea that I want to make myself redundant. And for some people making myself redundant is exactly that transition. The idea from my point of view is, as I said, to make myself redundant. And for some people, that's that transition completely away from coach into the occasional consultant. Like, I'll still talk to this dude about his technique occasionally. I was like, man, would like come to me with your programming ideas. I'll tell you about my experiences, that kind of thing. And we can talk about it because that's the learning piece. Most people don't want to go that far. They're paying a coach because they don't want to think about it. They want to be able to just do the work and that kind of thing. And that works great too. But if you only ever build a, a coaching model that exists on dependency, I think you are, it is a recipe for disaster, both as a coach and for all of your clients. I'd say it's borderline irresponsible. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Like it's it's genuinely not in the best interest of the lifter I, I think there's a, a gatekeeping is probably the word you can mm. use there it's like you have the information and absolutely it's valuable and you have to keep it to yourself rather than yep and i'd like to believe that no one truly thinks that way you know in this context yeah, I, I see i've i've met some people who do think like that right or at least they pro they put off a big enough image both on social media and in person that it feels very much like that's what they believe and that shit really grinds my gears I've seen it a lot with coach to coach kind of interaction. Oh like, yeah, absolutely. Even in opening all these gyms, sometimes I'll get like, oh, so-and-so is a PT down the road and they want to do a technique session. Should I do it? I'll be like, why wouldn't you? Yeah, the, the, the likelihood that someone's going to do one session with you, take your entire method and then put you out of business is like preposterous, but that's what it feels like sometimes. Yeah. And that's like, that comes down to that idea of it's the difference. Being, yeah. And, but the, it's that insecurity of, the idea that what makes you a good coach is your technical knowledge right like you and i i think both have pretty solid understandings of how all this whole process works i think we've both done a good job of developing models that are very similar but have some slight differences because of who we talk to and that kind of thing which is what this process is about but none of that shit is what makes us good it's the combination of that and who we are as people right like that's the thing that no one no one will ever do my model as well as I do because no one is me. Exactly. Right. And like, you can teach your model. I can teach my model. You can have a group of people that do it and, and present it as their own in that context. But it's still, even in something like zero, where you've got a whole development pipeline for all of your coaches, you're still going to get a slightly different interpretation of that model with every one of your coaches. Cause that's how the fucking thing works, right? Yeah. Like that's what coaching is, is an interpersonal relationship. And that's the thing that no one can do as well as you can. And I think as a coach, once you get to that point, you've realized that it's much easier to just give away this information for free in a way that like, I can sit you down and talk to you for three hours and explain my whole life view about training. You still are not going to walk away and be better at coaching than I am. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like yeah. that's just not how it works. Cause not only do I have that model and I can tell you it over three hours in a relatively succinct and mostly followable storyline, it took me fucking 15 years to get that point. Right. And in that 15 years, I've been coaching full time for 15 years or whatever it is. Right. It's that just, gap. Yeah, yeah. You can't take the model and the ideas, the cues, the training programs, and then just fucking drop that into being a perfect coach. That's not how it works. 
Yeah, that, it's the thing. At at some stage, I had to remind myself a little while ago. It's just like you know, like creating the coach development system as well and everything like that. I was like, well, if people do this, they have everything that I have. Like they have my entire tool toolkit. Is that the a risk? autism? Yeah, besides that, I can <laughs> Although, sell that for an extra argue, special price. I was going to say, I would argue most of the people signing up for the coach <laughs> development course either do or haven't been diagnosed yet. <laughs> Probably. Um, yeah, like it's, it's like I can. <laughs> I'm happy to tell you everything. I'll tell you yeah, exactly dude. how to coach. I'll tell you exactly how to open a gym. I'll tell you exactly how to do it. I'll give you all the tools and skills. But I've got 15 years of mistakes that you don't have. Man, I'm, and it, I'm like, 15 it almost, years ahead of you. You'll never catch up. It almost sounds arrogant, right? Like, Because I find myself thinking that occasionally as well. Like, dude, I can teach you how to run a powerlifting comp, right? I can show you all of the processes I use. I can do all of that. I promise you, you won't be as good at it as I am. Well, because for me, it's the opposite. It's like, it, it does sound arrogant at first glance, but it's, uh, on the other hand, I actually want someone to do it. Like, I yeah, want yeah, you absolutely. to catch up. I want you to surpass me. So it's going to force me to get better and, yeah. and continue to grow as well. Like, I, yeah, dude. I actually want that. Yeah, man. And I'm the same, right? Like, I, I think there's so much of, I, I think almost so much of the fitness industry is built on like the idea of insecurity, right? We And we talk about it a lot from a client side. We talk about people fear mongering around technique or learning things like that to clients. But I don't think we talk enough about it from a coaching perspective where like there are whole people whose entire coaching business is built on the idea that they need the validation that they are correct and what they know is right. My favorite thing in the world is when someone asks me a question to like justify an aspect of what I'm doing and I get a bit like frustrated and angry by it because that means I haven't thought through enough what I'm thinking about, right? And that's a really good indicator that I need to go away and do some thinking. And often I come back to conversations like that and I go, hey, I have a better answer for you because I got flustered and I didn't have the right answer for you. Here's what it is after I've thought about it a bit more and here's a better thing. And thank you because you've now helped me solidify my understanding of what I'm talking about, right? They're the discussions you should want to have. Exactly. Yeah. I, I want to come back to the arrogance thing as well because it's not, it, it can be misplaced as arrogance when in reality it's just confidence, right? Yeah, yeah and, exactly. And it's confidence that's gained because of the people that we listen to and learn from that made 15 years of mistakes before us. Yeah, like we're, yeah. we're here to pass the torch. We're yeah. ahead of a bunch of people, but a bunch of people are going to be way ahead of us in a way shorter time because of the mistakes that were made. It's like, we're, yeah. it's all about paying it forward. Right. Absolutely, man. And I, like, I think the the difference between confidence and arrogance is actually just a perspective thing, right? It, it can seem arrogant because you haven't seen the shit we've dragged through for 15 years. Right. Like you, you don't know the backstory on that. And it, that's where the line is. It's confidence from our point of view, because we know what we've suffered through if like all this time and all the dumb shit we used to think about as gospel that we now don't believe in quite the same way. And all that shit that you like, you look back on the discussions we had 10 years ago and be like, hmm, look at those little babies and how little they knew. And it's funny, right? But that's what makes it confidence is we've just continually done it and kept coming back for it. I mean, like this, this kind of circles back to the whole reason why as coaches, the more experience that you have, it becomes so self-fulfilling in the sense that you actually want to educate people. Like you made yeah. a comment before about wanting to make your, yourself redundant. I remember going through a phase that are halfway through my coaching career where I'm like, I actually need to hold back on the education. I'm going too yeah. hard on trying yeah, to give yeah. people information that they yeah, don't yeah. want. Yeah, yeah. And then eventually you find that sweet spot where it's like, I'm giving you enough information to create buy-in on autonomy without overwhelming you to the point where I'm speaking at you and over you. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a skill. It's a learned skill that takes time. Yeah, man. Cause it's hard. Cause I fucking love talking about this. Exactly. Stuff, right? Like I it's, get excited talking about it. It's why and we so made a I, podcast. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, it's why we record it weekly every month. Um, <laughs> but I, I often find myself talking at people a little bit and still have to catch myself constantly. Um, but the point I was going to make has fucking left my stupid head. Where are we going with that? Uh, I don't know. While you think of it, my style these days is less about uh, education via preaching and education via questions. I just, yeah. when someone asks a question, I keep asking questions back and get them to articulate their thoughts until the, until the penny drops. And they're like, 
ah, that's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and- I guide the conversation so they come to the conclusion themselves rather than being like, no, you're wrong. This is right. And and that's the difference in coaching and being like a trainer, right? Yeah. Like it's the difference between the person that has to shout the same six cues at you every single time you do a rep that you've been doing hundreds of reps of every week for years. And the person who's like, hey, what felt weird about that? did you notice this? Have you thought about it like this? Talk to me about what you're thinking about. Mm. Okay, cool. Now try this instead. Did that feel better? Yeah, cool. Right. The the big one is watch someone coach and watch what they do while the client's doing the set. I've worked really hard over the last probably 10 years to shut my mouth while people (laughs) are lifting and to be as passive as I can be when they finish. So I do my best to be like stone faced. How'd it feel? Right. I try not to be happy, sad or anything like that, because what I want is the closest we can get to a fully honest reaction to how was it? Yeah. I don't need you. And I never want you to default to my authority. Mm. That's not how it should work. Yeah. I'm here to guide you through this process, not pull you through it in a way that you have to follow my path or you're wrong. Right. Like that's, that that difference in approach is i think the thing that also means like i feel like in most cases i get the best results for clients somewhere in the like 12 to 18 month window right yeah. and i could get results in for many of those people much quicker by working them harder and being a bit more on top of them but in most cases when that happens 12 months after that they're gone yeah but if we get to that 18 month window and they start seeing this real nice hockey tick up, we've settled into a rhythm that works well for them. We've found a balance between life and training. They kind of have bought into the idea of where we're going two, three years from now. Cause from a coaching standpoint, I'm always talking about where are you two years from now? Sure. And the more we get to that point, the longer they stay around in a way that means they get continual progress exactly the average rate of progress over time is way greater than just slamming it for a year and then getting fucked or hating it and leaving it's the thing i say at the start of all of the like courses i do in the lead up to novice comp stuff like that is none of these courses are about how strong can you get in the next four to six weeks Mm. because any fucking idiot could get you into a gym, yell at you a lot, turn the music up, hammer you into the ground for four weeks in a way that you leave every session feeling like you gave it everything. And you get to the end of that four week period and you've made some progress. And then four weeks after that, you can't train hard anymore. Yeah. I frame it all as this four to six week period is about where do we go for the next six months? Yeah. Man, it's, it's, it's so interesting because like when you strip it to bare base, principles like that i had a conversation with a guy uh, a guy that wants to come on board he's he's totaling just under a thousand kilos uh, and obviously this guy wants to go hard uh, and he moves terribly and his body's starting to feel the, the results apart. of it just yeah. like in the last month the the week before he was starting with me uh he tore his adductor so it's it's put a yeah. it's it's put a bit of a um a block in the road so we've been going back and forth sorting his rehab out uh, but he's also tweaked a pick and I'm like, look, man, you, you're on the verge of something huge, but you're also on the verge of quitting completely. Yeah, and I can, dude. I can list you all the names of the people that you are in exactly the same spot in that quit. And then I can show you all the kind of people that were in this spot and then got better. Yeah. It's like you're at this crossroads and right now is a very, and I don't care if you go with me in the end or not, or go with yeah, someone yeah. else, but you have to fix this shit or you're not going to be the lifter you want to be. Yeah, uh, dude. It's, and it's, it's, that powerlifting inflection point, right? I don't remember exactly. what episode we did, but it was it was not that long ago. Yeah, where it was we probably did. It was, it was eight months ago, but it was three episodes <laughs> three, ago. <laughs> three weeks ago. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I've talked about this for years, but I've literally, I've had half a dozen discussions with, I took eight lifters to nationals and I've had six of these discussions where they were like, oh, so spring classic? I'm like, no, dude. Like, <laughs> if you want to, sure but I don't think that's the right decision. I think what you need is six months off, right? Like not off training, but you need an off season. You need like, in most cases, those lifters have been training hard for that 18 month, two year window where they've done a, you know, a couple of comps last year, got excited. Now it's like real push. 
you have to hit a wall and just slow down a bit. You need some stuff that isn't just bashing away at heavy barbells. You need some mental and physical time to chill and relax a bit and then come back out the other side because you want to still be powerlifting in five years, not make heaps of progress in the next six months and then be so hurt you can't keep going. And it's a really, it's a really hard shift to make because we all like lifting weights, right? But in the end, I think it's what ruined my powerlifting career was like I went back to back comps for six, seven years and just got to a point where I stopped making any progress and then turned it into my job and ruined it for me. <laughs> um, but it's a mistake I made. Like I literally made it myself and I'm trying my hardest to not let other people make that mistake because we've just seen so many fucking people do it. Yeah, man. Yeah, uh, it's episode 189. It was actually almost a year ago to this day. I think it's important. I wanted to look it up because I think it's actually one of the best pieces of content that we ever put out. I think it's yeah. really important for um, if you're a, if you're a serious lifter or borderline serious lifter. I think it's a really good good thing to listen to just to to check yourself because you are going to reach multiple crossroads that can really determine your place in this sport. And much like you, I if I had the education, I, I mean, anyone can say this, of course, but if I knew what I was doing to my body, to my hips, when I was doing it, yeah, I, I would be a very different lifter right now. Yeah, you man. Know, like and see, that's like you, I got out of it lucky, right? Like I got out of powerlifting without any serious injuries, without any ongoing issues or anything like that. I got out of it because I was mentally burnt out. Like I ruined the sport for myself mentally. I didn't, I was fortunate not to break physically most people break physically and that's what burns them out mentally. Yeah. Right? Like that's a far more common pathway than just being frustrated by it and not coming back, right? which is what I did. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So I've, I've got the opposite problem where I don't have the mental burnout aspect that I should, you know, yeah. I should, my body was telling me to stop and I didn't listen and uh, you know, I've, I'm fine. I can still lift and everything, but yeah, if yeah. I had, if I had received myself as a lifter when I was 23, I'd be like, this kid has some talent. Yeah. yeah. And I, I reckon I could have gone a lot further than what I ended up going, but I wouldn't have been the person that I am now. As yeah, I man. Now. It's, it's that classic discussion of like, of we course. wouldn't be here having that discussion if, if it was the case. Right. Um, the point I was going to make earlier was on the, that idea of like needing to, make myself redundant that's been a, a policy of mine basically since i started right you've always and, said it man always yeah, yeah. And, and i i only in probably the last 18 months have understood why mm -hmm. um and it's i've i've known deep down for a long time that's how i need to do it because i find very quickly like week to week i just don't understand why we're still here doing this right like i don't <laughs> understand why you still need me to to do this because we've it's the, I'm, we're having exactly the same discussion we had last week, right? Like nothing's changed. Why? I now understand it's partly because I get bored. Turns out I've got undiagnosed ADHD, which very quickly spirals into it. I provide a shit service. Like yeah. I'm not present. I'm not giving you what you deserve for the money you're paying. So I don't see the point. Which is crazy because logically, you know that these people just love you and they... Like you being you just your core existence without the knowledge of lifting is why they're coming to see you. Yeah. And the the problem with that is then I start resenting them. Right. Because <laughs> I'm like, I'm bored. Why are we doing this? Like yeah. I'm happy to chat and hang out, but like you've booked me for an hour and we stand here talking more about your week and watching a few sets of the same squats you did last week, but like five kilos heavier. It's it, it just I don't get excited by it. And that's why I built a business model that is based around the idea that I work more in a consultant realm like that with the technique coaching side of things because for me that's what actually coaching is right yeah. like that is here's a set of tools for you to practice go and practice them here's some guidelines around how to practice them and how to see consistent improvement and what progression looks like in different variants and come back to me when you have issues and mm. let's talk about it right because that like that's coaching no, i always just define the difference as coaching and being a trainer yeah like trainers count reps and talk about your week and that kind of thing and i'll i'll I'm, i don't count reps i'm fucking i cannot count reps for my save my life um but and i'm like i'm happy to chat it's not that i'm some emotionless robot who doesn't want to talk about those things i love talking shit and hanging out but to do it every week in a way that I'm now beholden to your schedule really frustrates me in a way that quickly builds resentment that isn't productive to any business relationship. And so I've set my business up to 
empower people to have those discussions, right? To be able to learn by doing as opposed to learn by listening and asking for feedback. Mm. Yeah, it's it's an interesting paradigm because like I maintain the same thing. I, if, if you want one of the best coaches around, I'll, I'm your guy. If you want a personal trainer, I'm literally not a personal trainer. And yeah, I, yeah. like I actually borderline envy personal trainers ability to shape shift and be exactly who they need to be for their clients for 40 sessions a week. Cause that yeah. shit's hard, man. Dude, like, it would, it would drain me these days. Like I found four days of powerlifting uh, and just existing around so many people at nationals brute. Like I wake up on the Tuesday coming home. I was like, cool. My brain is empty. I just need to like stare at a wall for 12 hours. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's weird. Cause it's almost like it's a job that requires you to show up as exactly the same person as the first session every time without fail. Yeah. Otherwise you've got an inconsistency in your service because it's nothing to do with your service and it's yeah. everything to do with who you are. I mean, like that's not completely true, but no, no, but it absolutely, point yeah, I'm yeah. Saying, right? it, but that's, it's part of the reason why I've been way more open with my client base about taking days where I'm just not here. Like I just, uh, Hey dudes, I'm just not up for it today. I will not be in the gym and mm. I've canceled and rescheduled sessions over the last 12, 12 or so months, just because I've woken up and been like, man, I am having a horrible day and you don't deserve to pay good money for me to be a miserable prick and not give you the service you deserve. Right. And every single person I've said that to has been incredibly understanding and, and on top of that. And I think that's part of potentially where the high turnover in the fitness industry comes from, right. Mm. Is because the only exposure most people get to what does a successful business model for a personal trainer or a coach look like is 40 sessions a week. Yeah. Paying rent in a commercial gym. Right? Yeah. And there's only so long you can do that before you just run yourself into the ground because you're actually an incredibly underqualified and poorly paid therapist for <laughs> 45 different people a week who actually care less about what they're doing in the gym than they do about being able to vent about their lives to the guy in the polo shirt. You, you know what I find interesting? This is kind of related, but also kind of not. I love a good is, tangent. Is when, you, is when someone comes to you and they're like, oh yeah, I was with so-and-so coach and they did this and they said that. And you know this other, like we've been around long enough to know most well-established coaches in the industry, like personally. Yeah. And you might know this person really well on a personal level. And you're like, that does not sound like them. And it, it, it can't help make you wonder, like, was it actually them, but they were caught on one of these days when they weren't them, you know, when yeah. they weren't showing up the way that they were meant to show up or how they always show up? Uh, of uh, You know, of course, there's the, um, the possibility that there's some embellishment of the story, a little bit yeah, GST always. sprinkled on top, but it's just yeah. interesting. And like, I mean, I've heard stuff about myself where I'm like, geez, that's not true. I sound like an asshole. I'm like, I mean, I am an asshole, but I'm not that big an asshole. Yeah. And not openly to everyone, just behind people's backs. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, man. It's it's one of those things. Like I've joked about it a bunch recently. I really shot myself in the foot. As someone who doesn't actually like people that much, setting myself up with a service-based business was not the best option. <laughs> like increasingly, I like it's great. I enjoy what I do. I love it deeply. But there are a lot of aspects where I'm like, man that maybe is not the thing I wanted to do. And it's ultimately why I've got a business that looks like I, it does, right? Like, yeah. it, because without knowing it, I've shaped a business that works really well for me and what I can do well, because the nature of being your own boss is like, you just, if you don't do some things they don't happen. And so it doesn't progress like that. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm going to finish on this because I think it's, we've gotten way off the original topic, but uh, yeah, but that was a I, nice roller coaster. I, I reckon it's the opposite for me. I reckon being in a service-based industry has saved my life because I watch things like the documentary about the Unabomber and I'm like, I, <laughs> I, I, I identify way too much with this guy. I'm I'm glad I have to be around people and, and show up and be a nice person because that was, that's the path I was heading down, living in the woods and sending, <laughs> sending nasty things to randoms. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not actually homicidal, by the way. No, no, but I like yet. I think I yeah, I was gonna say. Um, I increasingly recognize that like I like people, but I like people until I don't, and then I don't like people anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and when I don't like people, I need all of the people to leave. <laughs> um and yeah, that's turns out that's what being an adult is, at least in my experience. Anyway, we we are nice people. 
but come say hi. <laughs> oh man, that happened it happened to me at Nationals. I walked out of the toilet and a man whose name escapes me from Ruthless in New Zealand. Is it Ruthless in New Zealand? Yeah, yeah Mike. Uh, yeah, I walked out of the toilet and he just was like, oh, Sharon, hey, how you doing? And I was like, oh, yeah, good, man. Shook his hand and then walked away. And I just like thought nothing of it. And he came up to me afterwards and was like, like, I, like three hours later, he's like, hey, man, that was a real weird way to introduce myself. I'm sorry. And like properly introduced, like told me who he was. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I realized I know you because I like watch you, but you have no idea who I am. I'm like, yeah, man, that, that just kind of happens. I'm okay with that. Like, I'm not famous, but people all the time are like, hey, man, how you doing? Hey, dude, I don't know who you are. Smile Amazing. or not. It's Mike's great. the man. Shout yeah, out, was great. All right. All right. Goodbye, friends. Bye. We'll be back with another weekly episode sometime next month. See you.